Hey, this is Brad. We know there are a lot of things competing for your time. However, if you've taken the time to listen to our podcast and you like what we're doing, we'd love it if you would subscribe, review, or rate us. Thank you so much. What's going on, everyone? Welcome to this episode of Corner Table Talk. I am your host, Brad Johnson, and we are exploring subjects related to food plus strength plus culture. And as always, if you have questions and or comments about our show, you can reach me at brad at postandbeamhospitality.com. So in the early 90s, the actor and friend Danny Glover, a tireless ambassador of goodwill, was very active with the organization Artists for Free South Africa. A lover of the cuisine experienced during his many visits to Africa, Danny and I had several meetings and quite a few conversations about the idea of bringing food from the motherland to the United States and opening a restaurant celebrating African culture through a culinary experience. Now, this was in New York City in the early 90s. The restaurant that we had in mind, we knew we needed a major back of deep pockets and experience opening high profile establishments. So we flew to Florida to meet with the founder of Planet Hollywood, Robert Earl, at his home. Danny was one of the early celebrity endorsers recruited by Robert Earl and once dined at Planet Hollywood with Nelson Mandela and Harry Belafonte. That's how Danny rolls. <laughs> As enthusiastic as we both were, the idea was a little bit ahead of its time, and we were unable to garner the support needed to open, and the idea dissipated. Fast forward to 2022, and times have changed. International culinary pathways are rapidly expanding, and cuisine from the motherland, according to the food industry publication, Eat This, Not That, 2022 will be the year that African cuisine moves into the mainstream of American eating, much as foods from Asia, the Caribbean, and of course Europe have in decades past. Watch out for dishes from Nigeria, Senegal, and more, end quote. Well, it's about time. Our guest today was born and raised in Dakar, Senegal, West Africa, Chef Pierre Thiem, is a chef, restaurant, tour, cookbook author, co-founder, and president of Yo Le Le Foods. He is known for an innovative cooking style that is both modern and eclectic, but at the same time rooted in the rich culinary traditions of West Africa. Chef Diem is the chef and owner of the critically acclaimed restaurant in Harlem, Taranga, which serves fast, casual West African fare that is directly sourced from farmers in the region. In his most recent book, he celebrates Fonio, an ancient miracle grain grown for centuries in Africa that is both nutritious and gluten-free. He is a leading advocate for world hunger alleviation, responsible tourism, as well as a spokesperson for the rich culinary history of Africa and its diaspora. Chef Diem has been invited as a guest lecturer and guest chef across the globe to speak on these topics. He also informed me that he just recently moved to the Bay Area to raise his family. I'd like to uh, thank Ambassador Shabazz for this introduction and welcome Chef Pierre Thiem. It's so nice to meet you. Thanks for taking the time to join me today. It's my pleasure, Brad. Thank you for inviting me. Great to have you. So we pop things off with our short order questions, just a few things to, to get our juices flowing. So let's jump in. Tell me, what music might we hear in your restaurant and who makes the playlists? <laughs> I'm very involved with the playlist at Teranga. You may hear music that really is the African experience from West African music. I grew up uh, listening to jazz. I love Randy Weston, who was a dear friend and actually who introduced me to Danny Glover, who brought him to my restaurant. <laughs> it's funny connections. My music tastes really vary, but mostly. African and uh, African-American classics. Do you make the playlist yourself? I was involved in making it in the beginning and now it's taking that direction. But uh, whenever I come, I'm quite happy. And sometimes when I'm not 
<laughs> content, I, I, I make a comment, but it's doing great. Uh, so no, I don't make the playlist all the time. Excellent. So tell me, what is your morning beverage? What do you drink first thing in the morning? Water. Wake up and I drink a, a, a liter of water. I coffee after water. It's surprising, man, but I, I guess maybe not because so many people I ask that question, water is the first thing consumed. Me too. I like to drink a tall glass of water and, and then follow it with some coffee. Yep. So what about your exercise? What are you doing to uh, take care of yourself? Since I moved to the Bay Area, I took up running. I live in the hills. And so I, I start, you know, I, I, I walk up the hill. I don't run up the hill. I walk up the hill and I return running. So it takes me about three miles. I go run to this beautiful park behind the library in El Cerrito. And then I do some stretches, some I don't know, pull-ups, uh, push-ups, nothing too crazy. And then come back running. So nice. it, uh, it takes me about 30 minutes, more or less. Very good. So tell me, since you moved to San Francisco, my question was going to be your last great meal in New York City, but I'll broaden that to include the Bay Area. So let's just say last great meal. The last great meal was just recently. It was uh, at Chepanis when she reopened the restaurant uh, about a month ago. I collaborated with Chepanis. I'm not sure you're probably familiar with Chepanis. And uh, that was my first event in the Bay Area since I moved. I did a pop-up there. She gracefully opened her place for me. And she reopened officially, and so I had an amazing meal there. It was a, a five-course meal that was just fantastic. You don't mess around. You go right to <laughs> check these with it. <laughs> no That's the big it, it, it just happened. It wasn't planned. I did an interview with a local uh, journalist. She's always looking for stuff that good in Auckland. And she happened to have done one with Alice Waters. And Alice is herself who reached out to her because she was interested in phone and for the environment. And she, that grain that I've been promoting is something that she wanted to know more about. She invited me for lunch at her house and we became friends. And then the next thing I was doing a pop-up. That's fantastic. And we're going to talk a bit about Fonio because I'm, I'm really fascinated in that. Let's jump in. We were talking a little bit before we got started and you and I are just meeting and the pandemic has been so prominent for all of us. You mentioned the move out West as you were expecting your daughter. I want to start off with asking you how you're doing amid all of the craziness in, in the world and the move, everything okay? Yes, I, I would think everything okay in my universe. When I look at out, right outside, it's, it's quite quite scary. It's worrisome to see what's happening out there. The world is going crazy. I'm grateful. There was a term that, that I know a little bit about, but I'm curious to hear your definition of responsible tourism. What, what does that mean to you? Responsible tourism, I feel it as being tourism that is conscious and that is not extractive that is not unmindful of the culture that the tourist is visiting. The tourist should be the person who comes and really is immersing himself in the culture. I, I've been really deploring for the longest time going to countries like particularly in Africa and see what the tourist exposed to. And I'm coming from a chef angle. Take places that offer the kind of cuisine, for instance, that they are already familiar with cuisines from their own culture. If you come to Senegal and you would see French restaurants and, and, and Japanese restaurants in the best addresses and downtown, but you wouldn't see restaurants that would promote our beautiful cuisine just because it's a mindset. I feel like uh, the tourist is looking for that. The tourist is looking for an adventure. The tourist is looking to discover your, your cultures through your food. In particular, food is the best way to introduce one's culture. So when I travel, I, I look for those places. I go to marketplaces. I want to see where the locals are eating. That's something that should be available and accessible for the tourist. It shouldn't be something that they have to look hard for. So things are changing now, but it's really important. Yeah. I know Ambassador Shabazz takes out delegations with that intent. And Chef, I think back to being in high school, I remember going to Jamaica with a few friends of mine. It was our first trip as just a bunch of friends. We land in Montego Bay and we get on one of those buses that take you to your hotel and the grill. And I remember the faces of some of the people as we rode past them on a tourist bus. We were very obviously going to a hotel as a group. I felt a disconnect. It was like, this doesn't feel right. It just felt like we were coming there 
to go to a hotel, drive past their villages, drive past their homes, eat at a hotel, and not even conscious of it at that point. But I do remember having that thought that is how I'm meant to travel here. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm trying to say here. It's the tourist is coming, but he's uh, presented a, a, a plastic, a fake image of what it really is, what the country he's visiting is. So he returns not having really experienced the country, not having really connected with the country. And, and that's a missed opportunity. Yeah, I love the idea of, of responsible tourism. So during your, your TED talk from 2017, which I found fascinating, by the way, you spoke of having been born and raised in Senegal and through a combination of accidents and poetic justice, becoming a chef in the United States was, in your words, a form of cosmic justice. <laughs> that made me laugh. But before we get into your career, and I do want to come back to your TED talk, can you fill in your path from Africa to the U.S.? Initially, you studied uh, physics and chemistry. Where did the, the interest in science originate? So tell us a little bit about your path and your journey. Well, I, I grew up in Dakar, the capital city of Senegal. And just coincidentally, I was sent to the Department of Physics and Chemistry at university. My thing was the chemistry, really, just because I was better at that than all the things. <laughs> I didn't really particularly have a a desire or a dream and I didn't even have a, a vision of where I, I wanted to be after I graduated. This just happened to be the easiest thing for me and that's where I fell. <laughs> the easiest thing and, and when I say that I have to be careful it's not that I, I was excellent at it I was just better at it than, than the other things. <laughs> sometimes I would fail, sometimes I would make it, most times I would make it. I was very interested in other things such as I was political. I was part of a political movement, which is the student movement. And, and students in Senegal are very political. That's just a thing that, that's fascinating. So we, we were just going on strikes for so many different, we had so many griefs. Our, our scholarship weren't coming in time, so, or, or the, the food at the campus wasn't good enough. But there was always something that got us going into strike. And I was always at the front, just gone strike. Then one particular year, the strike went on for so long that the government decided to shut the university down. That meant that all of us had to start over again. That means, you know, our year was gone and blank. And for me, it wasn't an option. Why start over again? And for me and for many of my peers, we started to look for ways to continue our studies for that year. I looked for a scholarship or an application, and I found this school in Ohio, in Cleveland, out of all places, that accepted my application and was, was going to continue my degree in physics and chemistry. That means I didn't have to start over. Most people, my, my peers were going to, to, to France because that's the colonial country. That's, that was the easiest one. And I'm always going against the, the where people going. I'm like a salmon swimming a river. And so I applied and I got this application. I went to the embassy and I got a student visa. And I was like, wow, I got to figure out how to get it to make it to Ohio now. You know, I went to my parents, they didn't have much money. And my father managed to give me his savings, which were about $3,000. I was going to get there and figure out the rest. I would work. And, you know, I had a friend who was already there. And then school will help you and you can get a scholarship because you're good at certain things. So anyway, on my way to Ohio, to make a long story short, I left Senegal. And you have to land in New York and then take a bus to Ohio. That was what I could afford. A friend who had moved to New York maybe four or five months before me, a lot of my friends had left because of that uh, strike situation. He said, why don't you stop by New York for a few days and then go to Ohio? I'm like, yeah, New York. Of course, everyone wants to see New York once. I stopped by New York and three days after I arrived, I was robbed. New York 1989 was not the New York that, uh, that you see today. It was the crack epidemic, AIDS epidemic. It was just bleak and nothing. What I saw on TV was completely different than that New York. And, and, and I hated it. My friend lived in this really uh, crazy hotel that was located on 50th Street near Times Square. Not the Times Square Disneyland that you have now. It was Times Square where you know people were dead in the street people were shooting themselves in needles in the hotel everywhere it was a crazy one so i lost everything i lost those three thousand that my dad had given to me i didn't even 
you know know how to say that to him. It was just so embarrassing. I had my return ticket and I was very tempted to return, but I just didn't want to face my dad and say, hey, I'm black after, <laughs> after one week and I lost everything. Uh, so that's how I ended up in this world of the restaurant because another friend went to work in a restaurant in the village and they looked for a busboy. The only job that didn't require any particular skill was a busboy. All I had to do was take empty glass, empty plates into the kitchen, come back, that's it. That was my entrance in the restaurant world. That entrance just really opened a whole other world for me. When I would go in the kitchen, Every single person in this kitchen were male. And I'm coming from a culture where women are in the kitchen, women cook. And I'm like, wow, these guys are making this amazing food. And this seems so fascinating. I was really taken by this world. They noticed it. The chef in particular noticed it. The chef is someone who spoke French and he liked to practice his French. So he liked having me in the kitchen. Whenever I would come, he would say some words to me and I would respond. So he, he was like, Hey, I know your story. You're trying to make extra money. You want to go to Ohio. I don't know why, but you know, he's like, <laughs> so once you make extra shift after bus, you come and wash dishes. This is how I started. He was like a mentor. He told me his story. He started washing dishes. That was the old school. You go from the bottom up and um, wash dishes and you practice French with me and I'll teach you some stuff. And gradually you may like what, what I'm doing here. That's what happened. I hated washing dishes. I, I hated it. I, I didn't even think. I, I, I was going to stay in New York. I always thought manual work wasn't for me. I was coming with that mentality of um, an intellectual and I'm going to do things. So I, I washed dishes until uh, the first prep guy didn't show up. They took me to do the prep and I started peeling potatoes and chopping onions. The next thing, the garden manager doesn't show up and they teach you how to make a vinaigrette, how to dress salads. That's when it really starts to get interesting for me. I'm starting to see the connection with chemistry. Because mm. the vinaigrette is an emulsion, and they even call it an emulsion. And those reactions were things that I knew in theory, those things that I knew at, at lab, at university. And, and I was like, this is something I even like better than chemistry. And chemistry, I didn't even know why I was doing it, but this is like instant gratification. You do it, and then you taste it, and it's, it's good. And there's a path to growing. I left the other market, I became grill, I, I came to the line. And, and now I had a skill, I, you know, over years. Chef Billy was also guiding me through books. To, I always loved to read. It was something I took from my mom growing up in Senegal. She made sure every Wednesday she would take me to this library, the French um, um, library in, in our neighborhood. So I loved to read from that time. And cookbooks became my thing. And, and he guided me through reading cookbooks and, and just really loving this world. So that's really cool. And you started to find your way. I want to just stay for a moment, though. I just finished my binge last night on the Andy Warhol Diaries and his relationship with Jean-Michel Basquiat. And it really gets into the culture in New York City in the, the late 70s through the 80s, which, as you mentioned, it, the, the end of the decade was the end of a lot of things. AIDS crept into everyone's life. Crack, as you mentioned, was just running rampant around the city. Crime, New York yeah. was in a rough spot. And this the, the documentary really just brought all of that home. I was thinking about that as you were talking about the city that you found when you got there in 1989. Jeff, I'm, I'm curious, you, you get to a foreign land, you decide you're going to hang out in New York for a while, you're working in restaurants. But I also, and this correlated with what I had mentioned up top about Danny and I and our, and really Danny's ambition to open up an African restaurant. But you mentioned somewhere I, I heard or read that uh, you, you didn't find any African cuisine anywhere, that there were a couple of mom and pops around, but for the most part, that cuisine wasn't represented, even though New York is known or thought of to be the, the culinary capital of the world. So I'm, I'm curious how a young man coming here from another country, from Africa, just how did you move around the city? How did it feel to you? Was it just so foreign and not having your food or were you just grooving and saying, this is New York is everything I thought it would be? It was nothing that I thought it would be, but it was very fascinating. Obviously, I'm coming from Dakar and New York. New York is New York. But it really, with curiosity, I've always been very curious. And, and I, I, I went looking for those flavors. This is really the part that was very important to me. I know if you know Senegal, the food culture is really rich. This is something we take really seriously. Is at noon, the country stops. Everyone goes home for lunch, and the lunch is something that's elaborate and prepared with love. In New York, lunch was 
just a sandwich you know, or, or, or McDonald's. That's what you could afford. And the flavor wasn't there. It was, you know, something was missing. Not only the flavor, but there's like a whole food culture. We eat around the ball. We eat together, family, that whole sharing. It adds flavor to the food. And the food tastes better. We eat with our hands. You know, all those things were, were missing in New York. I was working now in these fancy restaurants. I was working in this restaurant in Soho. And that's when I started to really think about African food has its place here. Senegalese food in particular has its place here. Because the chef was someone who was also curious and well-traveled, who had been mostly in Southeast Asia, but that cuisine had some similarities with ours. They were using those gold flavors. They were using fermentation, which is very big in our cuisine. They were using citrus and, and spices, you know, all those things. That was quite new in New York at the time. New York was mostly the classics, French, Italian, Chinese. That was it. Now Indians were coming, Thai was coming, and, and that place in Soho, we were doing really and Thai and all that. So I said, hey, this guy is presenting this food, which is ethnic food, which is traditional food, but he's presenting it in an elevated way. And this is something I want to do with African food. I saw it as an opportunity. New York is the place to do this thing. And, and I never looked back. It became a mission for me. With a, a lot of the talk in the last few years has been the um, African diaspora and how food didn't make its way out of Africa and made its way to the southern United States during the slave trade and how certain grains and, and items, yams, are part of the southern diet that were traditionally from African cuisine. I'm curious, the first time, though, that you sat down at Sylvia's or one of the soul food joints and had an American version of soul food, did you connect that to Africa? Oh, oh yes, it was familiar. I think that's part of my inspiration, absolutely. I was like, hey, this is our food. Gumbo is, was my favorite food growing up. I'm a sucker for gumbo. And I'm like, they have it here. That's where I could find those flavors. Then I made the connection and that connection stayed even as things started to happen for me. I opened my first restaurant and wrote my first cookbook. The, the a chapter of that book became dedicated to the Middle Passage. That was the title of that book. And, and the Middle Passage was about that connection that I made at places like Sylvia's, you know, Lola's and Cafe Beulah's. And there was a few other restaurants in New York that was serving Southern food. That's where I could go and find something that looked like my mama's food. That's, that's really what it was. Sorry, I didn't know that story. I discovered it and, and I was like, wow, 400 years, but the flavors stayed. We kept that food culture and this is amazing. You realize how powerful culture is because we kept that. The music is still stirring me, still there. The same, how do you say, even the same root, the blues, you said too. To jazz, you can connect it directly to where we're from. This really is something, the way we move, the way we, everything is like 400 years didn't just take it away. So culture survived all of those hardships and that's really powerful. But food, the food story was one that I really thought was important that we tell. It was important that we keep celebrating because it's a resilient cuisine. It's a beautiful, resilient and delicious. Hearing you talk that way makes me think of the word reunion. It feels like a reunion, you connecting with the food that reminds you of this place, but that's a beautiful imagery. So early in your life, you were influenced by Senegal's first president, Leopold Sadar Senghor, who served from, I think he served from 1960 to 1980. From, he uh -huh. was considered a cultural theorist who was thought by many to be one of the most important African intellectuals of the 20th century. You mentioned being influenced by his talk of the new humanism, which in his description, a universal civilization in which all cultures would, would gather around communal tables as equals, each bringing its own beautiful contribution to share. He called it the rendezvous of giving and receiving. You know, it's an interesting note to me because communal tables, as you probably know, it became a, a big thing in the last, we'll say 10 years, but certainly in the last five years. I know my last place, we had two long communal tables. And I've wondered with the pandemic, and you talked about sharing food and eating food with your hands, if the communal table is going to survive. But can you discuss President Singor's influence and what resonated with you about this concept of new humanism? New humanism to me, as opposed to the one that we, we were living. A, a place where we are equal. We were uh, coming from a place 
where we had been colonized and, and colonization was telling us a different story. We, are, we were inferior, we were not worthy. Everything was inferior. Our food was inferior, our, 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 our ways were inferior, our culture, our, our This one is saying, hey, not only you are equal, it's not saying you're superior, you are equal to them. And, and, you, and, and what you have is worthy and what you have, they need it. You have to bring it to them for this, finally, this humanity to get to where it's meant to go. Each of us have a contribution that's as valid, as, as, as worthy. So this was the message that I was getting from Senghor. And our contribution was mostly coming from our culture, the way we move in this world, in this universe. And this is something that has been transmitted to us by, from our ancestors. Those are lessons we came and we realized that we are part of a greater universe. And this is something that's typical. That's, that's very much of an African approach. We are not dissecting. We are embracing the universe. And this is something that I believe once integrated by the, the rest of the world, we will change many things uh, the way we approach it. Uh, in, in brief, Senghor was a, a guide in a way. He was an inspiration. He had his flaws in trying not to, to judge anyone because you never know the, the circumstances he was living in, but he was happened to be the first president of Senegal in a time of colonial time when France was definitely not ready to let go of its colonies. So they had to deal with, I'm sure, quite an, um, a mass, a certain amount of pressures. But he, he was able to keep the country in a stable way. His method was very much African too. He was about dialogues. He was about making sure our culture was always uh, mindful that our culture is important. So he promoted the arts. He was a big supporter of the arts. You see, a lot of uh, great minds that came out of, of, of that tiny country. That was because of the approach that he was taking to politics. I see that as a visionary, really, because he's, he realized that confronting the French or the colonials directly was not maybe the wise way. Others have tried it and, and have, have been eliminated. He figured out another way to confront it by building a strong people, a, a nation, building a nation with a sense of, of self, a sense of culture. Those people will be in the future, maybe not his generation, but other generations will come with the, the tools and, and, and the ways to change things at home and, and abroad. I think that's why we had all the people allowed to blossom. They had differences, but they were allowed to blossom and bring their contribution into what became the Senegalese nation. The wisdom that he had of not holding on to power is a president who decided to step down for no particular reason but the fact that he thought I had been in power for long enough you know I need to go and do all the things I want to write my books he was a poet he always said he was a poet and the country will be led by better able people this was not something we were used to see in, in Africa at the time presidents would stay in power until there's a coup and then then they are killed or something happened. And that was unfortunate. That was the situation that changed. You no, know, Sango and Nelson Mandela are the only ones who had stepped down on their own will. That was a very important symbolic move and inspired many of us. It inspired me. We had on our program Dr. Julius Garvey, the son of Marcus Garvey. He was just fascinating at 89, so sharp. And he talked about the African mind and having an African mind. But I want to come back to that in connecting what you were just saying. Here you are, this kid, you get to New York, which is if you can make it, <laughs> you can make it anywhere. So they say you start working in a restaurant. Tell me a little bit how you went from working in the restaurant to becoming a chef and an author. How did that come together? Did you just have a, a mindset of once you started to lock in? You knew what you wanted to do, and you had this belief in yourself, this confidence that you could get it done. How did you evolve from working in a restaurant to owning a restaurant and becoming an author? I, I was a hard worker. I, I knew that once I figured out that the restaurant was the world that I wanted to be in, once I realized that I, I saw that path, even though I, I never knew why I was in, in chemistry, this was why I was in chemistry. And my mom reminded me when I was five years old, my favorite Thing was to look at her cookbooks for the picture. It wasn't even an option for me to cook, but I, I loved the pictures in it. So I think this was already part of it. Now here I'm in New York to get to your question. I was working hard because 
I was afraid of failing. I was coming from a mindset that if you don't get your degrees, you are a failure. And now I'm not getting my degrees. I got to make sure I do it this way. The only way for me to do it is to work hard. Whenever there was time uh, to add on my shift, I was the first one to, I was the one, the, the hardest working one in this restaurant when I started to uh, see that the, the restaurant was showing me a path to making this vision of African cuisine a reality. But I had to understand the restaurant world. I had to understand the, the chef's mindset. I had to understand how that was working. I know I wasn't going to culinary school. This was my culinary school. In doing so was to make sure I work as much as hard as possible, learning the pastry, learning the, the savory. Uh, something most chefs don't do. Most chefs, they focus in one part, but I wanted to embrace and understand everything. After that time, the chef and the owners noticed it, and that restaurant was very successful. That restaurant that was the, the, the talk of the uh, mid-90s in New York. It was booming on Spring Street. And, I mean, we had Prince, we had Madonna, we had like, I mean, Lenny Kravitz every day. Like, he was just the, the, uh, the A-list clientele. And the restaurant opened a new location in Miami, in South Beach. I was the first choice. And I, I was sent to Miami as this young chef. But I had already started moving up the, the ladder of that restaurant, become sous chef. And, and so I was sent to Miami and the chef knew that he trusted me. He was like, you're going to do it. You can do it. You're going to run that restaurant, open it in Miami. That's the winter time that the same clientele that we had in Soho would go in Miami. They already know you. Now it's time for you to step up. I had a mission. Bring the food that you've been serving to us during family meals because family meals is the time when I would bring back the food from my memory, the food from childhood, the peanut sauce and the onion and, and the yasa and, and, and chilies and all those things. So the, the chef was like, add it to the menu, start a special and then gradually. So he built my confidence and, and I did it and, and it was Just great. Anybody who's listening and doesn't know what family meal is the meal that the restaurant staff, the kitchen prepares for the staff, but it doesn't always have to be from the kitchen. Sometimes a server might, if they're talented enough, might contribute to the family meal, but go ahead. So you were making food that you knew for the family meal and people were loving that. Oh, they were loving that. There were flavors that they didn't have, they never had before. They would come back for second. This is African food for them. Africa is a country. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's a, it is African food. And this is the kind of food chefs, this will be great in the restaurant. And it, he was right. It became the, the thing that really distinguished me from the others. So when I returned to New York, I was now not looking back. I'm going to start as I'm still, you know, doing my shifts at the restaurant, but I started catering. I'm starting to get to know people who are wealthy and who want to have special events, but different type of events, new flavors, Africa was exciting. And I was that person. So it, I started the catering and the catering became my very first restaurant it called Yolele. And that restaurant became a destination. Talk about Yolele because this grain phonio that you mentioned, I'd never heard of it until I met you or, and, and was, was introduced to you. And you mentioned Alice Waters also perked up um, when she learned about it. Talk, if you will, just describe a little bit. I know that it's, it's the processing of, from listening to your TED Talk, what I got is that the processing is difficult and the farmers are having to do both. And you were working on trying to create a mill that would be world-class that could do the process, take that off of the shoulders of the farmers, let the farmers farm, create the system of delivery for Fonio. Talk a little bit about what Fonio is so people can understand it that are hearing it for the first time. And describe a little bit about where you are in the, pro in the process. Fonio is the oldest cultivated grain in Africa. It's been cultivated for 5,000 years. It's an ancient grain. That's a nutrition powerhouse. It's uh, very nutritious. It's gluten-free. It's rich in fibers. In addition to being great for, for your health, well, it's also great for the environment. It grows in poor soil and it regenerates the soil because it has deep roots that adds nutrients to the soil. It's, it grows in an area called the Sahel, south of the Sahara, very dry, arid, and Fonio thrives in that area. In addition to that, which is very much more important as a chef, is the fact that Fonio is delicious. It's a delicate grain. It has a neutral flavor, kind of nutty, and it's very versatile, which is great. For me, I, I, I love that I just did to so many different types of cuisine, and it, and it worked. Uh, I, I was really shocked when I was writing my second cookbook and I was traveling around 
Senegal, I wanted the readers to connect with the, the food that I was cooking, the source of that food, because I thought it was very important for the readers to connect with the source of that food. I'm in this most remote part of Senegal, and Fonio is the grain that 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 is considered the, the, the grain for royalty in that region. I was shocked to, to rediscover it there, because even in Dakar, you couldn't find Fonio. And so as a chef in New York, I was very naively thinking, hey, I can introduce this grain to New York, then it's going to be a world-class grain, and these people are going to be living uh, out of poverty. They're going to be, you know, prosperous. This is economic opportunity for them. It didn't make sense that a grain that grows in poor soil, it grows in top soil, it regenerates the soil in an area like ours. That's very important because the desert is advancing, so it's going to help to mitigate that. We talk about climate change. It's a grain that requires very little water plus it's a grain that versatile it has to be there it has to be accessible so that was my challenge i'm going to make it accessible all i have to do my simple plan was to bring the grain and introduce it to my peers in new york the food community is, is a small community we all know each other we all hang out in the same places or we are invited to the same things or we go to each other's restaurants always looking for new flavors for new products they were always excited. That was my approach. So I was going to bring it to some chefs. I brought some chefs, great chefs to Senegal, and they were all introduced to Fonio and all started to use it on their menu. In addition, I realized that I had to create a chain of value. I had to organize the farmers and bring in containers of Fonio. I had to distribute it. So now I need to get into collaboration, get the right people on my team. And that's how I found a co-founder, Philip, who was also a veteran in the food industry, who had been bringing quinoa in the U.S. like uh, a decade ago. You know, it's, this was the past that I wanted. And we did. We started bringing Fonio and shipping it to Chicago and Woodland would package it for us and then distribute it. The first place was distributing it at Whole Foods when they opened near my restaurant in Harlem. I was like, I'm here, your neighbor. And they, they said, OK, let's give it a chance. <laughs> and they tried it. And I had to go to Whole Foods myself and do the tastings and, and do the demos and make sure people taste it. No one knew what it was. But every time I would do it, the grain would fly off the shelf. It would sell out. And, and Whole Foods noticed, invited us to other stores gradually. We were doing Union Square and then the other stores, Times Square, around all the Whole Foods in New York. Today, we are distributing all the Whole Foods in America. And, and Fonio is a champion in its category. We expanded now, we added all the Fonio pilafs, all still the same method as using all the ingredients from those regions of West Africa so that the small farming communities can have a way of selling their products, have access to market, which was their challenge. They didn't have access to market. And I realized this is a path to development. This is like a path, the clear path, their own products, and they add value. And the market is there because the market is hungry for this. The market is the limited number of grains that they, they don't have access to and that's affecting our health, that's affecting the planet. Because those crops, if they don't have market, they disappear. Many crops have disappeared like this. We, we do, we're tackling so many fronts. We're addressing climate change. We're bringing opportunities to small farmers and we expanding people's access to food. We're expanding, we're diversifying their diet which is very important, especially a grain like Fonio, because for me, it's, it's most important for, for us in the diaspora, African-Americans. This is a grain that's in our DNA. So it's a grain that our ancestors have been eating. When you trace it, there was traces of Fonio in the Gala Island. There was traces of Fonio in the Dominican Republic. It, it arrived through the Middle Passage. But it's in a, Egypt as well, right? Fonio was in the pyramids. It was taken to the afterlife. That's how important that grain is. It's the grain that culturally, is. If, if you go back, that's the grain. They, they have so many beliefs around Fonio. The Dogon people, they call it the seed of the universe. So it's an important grain. And, and the world needs to know it. And the world would have missed out if, if this grain disappeared. Yeah, it's just such a fascinating series of events to have rediscovered it. And you're talking about decertification and land degradation and now the possibility of a rebirth of that land and a viability that people would have thought was not possible for the land itself and for the people. It's just amazing. So can you yeah. find you now in Whole Foods? 
Oh yeah, yeah, you can find in Whole Foods, you can find in Target. Kongolele <laughs> was the name of my first restaurant and it also became the name of the, the company. So Fulani is a part of my uh, heritage from my father's side. And Fulani are the uh, largest nomadic group in the world. Actually, it's not the gypsies, it's the Fulani. The Fulani has been crisscrossing Africa for, for thousands of years. And I like that nomadic aspect. I was also a nomad in a sense. And I want this food culture to transcend the borders. Those borders are not real, especially when it comes to Africa. I don't believe in borders to begin with, and but in particular in Africa, because those borders were imposed upon us. So it's in a sense, it's a decolonizing act. It's bringing back this food that disappeared part of it because of the colonization. You know, So it's intentional. And that's why I really wanted it to be uh, that name from a nomadic uh, culture. But also it's a celebration. Yolele is a celebration in, in, in Fulani. It's an expression of joy. It's an expression of celebration. So I like to translate, let the good times roll. When you look at it, it looks very musical. It, so, it is. And that's so dope, man. I want to wrap the, the last couple of questions into one if I can. So you had talked about, you had said that bringing people together to share a meal is really valued very highly in African culture. It's one of the highest values that there is. And obviously restaurants, that's, that's what we do. Aside from drinks and food, it's about bringing people together. We celebrate, we mourn, first dates, last dates. Restaurants provide that kind of an atmosphere. I'm curious how you view a restaurant's role in a community, especially when we look at things through the lens of what happened the last couple of years when restaurants went away. And given your mindset, it's such a high value to welcome people in and be hospitable. How do you view a restaurant's role within a community? The restaurant is such an important part of the community, especially when you take it with uh, that African Senegalese understanding of what food is. Food is this unifying agent, really. And the restaurant is that at large. My restaurants have never been just about serving food. It's always a cultural destination, a cultural place where you would have events where the people would just come and bring what they have to contribute, the same idea of giving and receiving. And with the pandemic, the industry got hit so hard. For the first days, I was really wondering, are we going to close it? I'm realizing that, no, it's not the case. And now we are part of the community. We are going through this crisis. As a restaurant, we have to adjust and serve the community as it. And what Harlem needed at the time, we first thought about the first responders. People were working extra overtime to help the, the people who were sick. So how do we bring food to them? We started to figure out a way to bring food to the first responders because we were next to a, a Harlem hospital that was getting full. And that became a thing that really took off. It was also a way for us to keep our staff on the payroll because we were now serving the first responders. The restaurant wasn't receiving people inside, but we were taking our food and shipping it out. And it even became a segment on ABC television about how Teranga was taking the food to the first responders. Then we saw another need of the community because the schools were closed. And we had kids in the shelters in Harlem, lunch at school, and now they didn't have access to, school, uh, to, to that lunch anymore. So we partnered with the company organization Harlem Grown, the wonderful organization in Harlem. We figured out a way to take Teranga's food to the shelters, to those kids in the shelters. That really was, for me, an important part. If you have to tell me you, what I did in the restaurant world that really was worth um, mentioning this was that moment when those kids in the shelters which we don't even see them now they're receiving this food and they're sending pictures of the kids receiving the food and, and, and some of them never had even those flavors because it's just I was serving West African food uh, but they're loving it it was really moving and I felt like you know, the restaurant is doing what it's supposed to be, it's restoring people. And we survived this way Ranga, we opened another location during the pandemic because we figured out the way to serve the community and the community gave it back to us. We started to feel. And there were so many other ways. These marches around Black Lives Matter. During the marches, there was an opportunity to bring the food to the marches. People figured out the business model around it that kept us going, that kept the doors open, that kept us out. You know, thank God we see a light at the end and now we're receiving people in the restaurant again. 
and it reminds me, it's a karmic experience, right? You give out this hospitality and this joy of providing for these kids and it's beautiful. And to see their reaction just, it, it invigorates you. It just perpetuates you wanting to continue that yeah. cycle. I think that, that's a beautiful illustration. Thank you. So the last couple of things here, as I mentioned, we had Dr. Uh, Julius Garvey on the show. And he talked about the African mind, which acknowledges Africa's birthplace of civilization, and one that challenges the notion of a Eurocentric worldview. We were talking specifically about Black folks, but I think this applies to everyone, that we have a dependency syndrome and in the form of European dominance and our own inferiority. I'm interested in this, particularly with you, because Dr. Garvey emphasized the importance of a strong mind, knowing where you come from, an understanding of history and freeing of ourselves from mental slavery, the famous line that Bob Marley also sang about. You come from Africa, you come to New York, you end up doing business in Harlem. I'm curious, Chef, if you feel a different mindset than some of your brothers on the ground in New York when you get there who have had a different experience than you. Did you feel that you brought what Dr. Garvey is referring to here as an African mind to that equation? I would say yes and no. Yes, because I, I, I came from a different experience and, and I had different tools with me. No, because I was also coming with a colonized mind. I, I, I had been colonized in addition to, to that I think we haven't talked enough about the trauma that's passed on from generation to generation. That trauma is in, within all of us from the diaspora who, who have been colonized, who have been enslaved one way or another. So this was something that, and that Gavi is saying is right about we, we both needed to emancipate ourselves from, from that mindset. And I had to, to go through it. I think New York helped me be more African than I would have been if I had stayed in Africa. This is something that I've learned and a lot of people guide me through it, including African-Americans, great mentors who, who allowed me to see who I was. And I saw it. And unfortunately, many others don't see it. I saw that greatness in, and I wanted to claim it in my own way. For me, it was through my cuisine. For me, it was through my entrepreneurship. For me, it was through, through just really sh sharing it with, with the world. And, and that was really an easy way. Once you see it, it was easy because all I had to do is, is to look back into that well, that bottomless well of like inspiration that the ancestors have already left for me. And, and for me, it was looking for food for you know, these traditions and these ingredients and just bringing them back. But it could be anything. It doesn't have to be food. It could be really anything. We have so much source of inspiration that we can just dig and, and get. But it's really, uh, it happens once you emancipate yourself from, from that mindset, that colonial mentality. That's the, the challenge. That's what made the difference for me. Before that, I think I was just a lost immigrant who, who was trying to find his way. And I would have gone that path had, had I not taken the time to, to reflect and, and luckily find some guides along the way and read. I think a lot of great books also inspired me to dig deeper. This story, the sort of long way around the bush. No, it's, it's, a, it's a great answer. And, and I didn't know what to anticipate. It was an honest question. I really wanted to hear how you answered that. And it's fascinating. I do think that, you know, there should be more conversation around this idea of freeing ourselves from mental slavery, because although we can all sing the, the Marley lyric, I, I don't know if we really stop to think about the impact of what that really means or, or what that process would really entail. I think you just laid it out, you know, really well. So, Chef, last thing here before I let you go. Um, read an article that appeared in the New York Times recently by the columnist David Brooks. I'm going to get your reaction to it on the other side. So uh, he wrote, quote, globalization is over. The global culture wars have begun. He makes the point that 25 years ago, quote, the world seemed to be coming together. So he went on to say, quote, this was an optimistic vision of how history would evolve, a vision of progress and convergence. Unfortunately, this vision does not describe the world we live in today. The world is not converging anymore. It's diverging. 
The process of globalization has slowed and in some cases even kicked into reverse, end quote. So I'm curious about your thoughts as this view, while initially it was aligned with what President Senghor talked about, that uh, you admired, so this view of uh, new humanism now seems world events are forecasting a different outcome. Do you still think that it's possible that we are all going to continue to gather around a, a universal proverbial communal table? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and more convinced, I think globalism was not that at all. Globalism was still one culture above. It was dictated. It wasn't really something that it wasn't centered on humans. It wasn't. It was really an angle of capitalism. It really was about the, the shareholders' bottom line, in a sense. And the industrial countries were, were dictating the path to globalism. It was imperialism of those countries and those cultures. And I think the crisis we're going through is a necessary one. It's unfortunate. It's really unfortunate. And I have to be careful with the words that I use. But and you know, maybe that's the optimistic in me. But I, I think it really is important that we 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 shift gears and and we realize that to reach that humanism, it's very important that we each have our saying. We each heard. Everyone is heard, and many cultures are not heard. We didn't feel heard, and you just see it in. I'm not sure the context of his article, but I'm I'm suspecting. Is probably coming from the crisis in Russia today and in Ukraine and, and maybe the pandemic. But the reason that's triggering this kind of conversation is interesting because these crises have been happening in other parts of the world and being ignored. I mean, Yemen has been in crisis for seven years and that country is being bombarded. But it didn't trigger the thinking of reconsidering globalism because Yemen is not part of that globalism. Yemen is one example. Many other countries in the south or the other side that are not bringing that kind of reaction or that are not really making us reconsider the direction we are taking. It took countries of that world, of western countries, Ukraine, with blue eye, blonde hair, like Brother Malcolm would say. But that's really what made it really sink in and make them realize that hey this is not working but this was not meant to work it was not sustainable because it wasn't uh, centered around humans it was centered around economic interests it was centered around other other values which are important but they're, they're, it's not the whole as long as we don't take the whole thing and what humanism is about it has to be centered around human it has to be around about every human the, the, the smallest one you know, everyone has the contribution, and that wasn't the case. And that's, I think this is this crisis and other crises are going to take us closer to that space because we're going to reconsider ourselves and also opportunities, the great opportunities that come from crisis. And the pandemic was one. Just the example I, I gave you with the restaurant and how we were able to go through the pandemic and, and see that there was an opportunity, and that really made us a better business, that for sure, a better business. And the community loves us even more. The community is really your business. The people are your business. You put the human before everything. And you start your thinking and your planning around the real human interest with sincerity. I think you can't go wrong. But if that and I don't know what globalization did either to take care of the planet. So I'm, I'm with you. But, you know, we, we also have to include the planet so that, so that we have a place to, to enjoy one another. But Chef Pierre, Tim, I am so interested in following your career, man, and, and what you do and, and what you stand for. And just your bright mind and your world vision, I think, is just really a breath of fresh air at a time when we, when we really need it. So, Chef, before I let you go, I know you're an author and the authors don't sit still for very long. So I know you got a little something else you're working on. Tell us about what's next uh, for you as an author. Yes, I, I just finished my manuscript that's coming out next spring. So it's really exciting. And uh, this book is meant to be really me in America. My first three books were about the introducing food that inspired me. Then the second was really about meeting the producers, introducing my food culture to the readers. The third one was on Fonio, focusing on one single brain. This one is really the book that the publisher is seeing as being read in 
everywhere in Middle America, making it easy, West African cuisine accessible on a Tuesday, Monday night. So that's really the book that, that, that's taking you to that level, making this cuisine more broad and more approachable and less intimidating. It's going to be more intimate to my life in West America, in uh, California. So it is, uh, it's going to be about the food that I serve to my family, my wife, my daughter. So that's really about that. We, we look forward to that in 2023. 2023, spring of 2023. Yeah. Spring of 2023. Chef, thank you so much, man. It's a pleasure to talk to you, and uh, I look forward to seeing you soon. So welcome, everyone. Here we are with Ambassador Shabazz and how we move following Chef Pierre Thim. So thank you so much for that introduction. What a fascinating guy. Correct. I'm so happy. You never know when the best time is, but be, certainly he and I having an opportunity to speak a year ago and me sharing with him about the Corner Table Talk podcast and wanting him to come on. But everything is right on time because the enthusiasm, where we are in a culture right now as it relates to opening up and sharing and having that that fellowship sensibility about eating once again, as opposed to the circumstances we were in at the time that he and I first started talking. I love this conversation where we can be a little bit more reflective and on the upside of all of those things so that he could speak more about the things that really do matter at this point. It was great for me to listen to a Senegalese. Senegal was one of the many countries that was part of our household growing up, including the foods and the people and the history. I think now as people are doing their DNA, they're finding out that they have at least 1% combination Senegambian or something like that, that just moves around. Also, even if it's not in your DNA, it's in our culture, just by virtue of all that Senegal brings to the Western hemisphere culturally, socially, and not just food, but the histories and the foundation of the OAU. When you mentioned President Senghor, here, while we're always talking about the freedom to vote or engage or what is independence, we're talking about Juneteenth a lot now. But when you think about the founding countries of the Organization of African Unity, those are powerful men that independence is what defined that union, the African Union. That was happening in the late 50s, early 60s, where those countries and that pan-African sense from the continental side, an understanding of pan-Africanism was not about hue or tone. It wasn't about degrees of, it was really about statesmanship and preservation of cultural origin, notwithstanding the colonial imprint, period. So when you look at the photograph of those 32 some odd founding. Now there's 54 countries that are acknowledged, but that body of 30 presidents, all men at the time, they ranged with language, background, orientation, but what they knew singularly or specifically was their right for nationhood, for their nationalism, uh, per their respective countries. Um, what, what did you make of his answer that it was a bit of both, him having the colonial mentality that he had to alleviate himself of, but at the same time having an African mind? That's part of the truth. And usually Americans, when we're assessing an African, we do not take into consideration that their independence days are much more, much closer than ours. So we're talking about our 400 years and our 150 some odd years of independence when theirs could be anywhere from 20 to 60 years from, from now. So that's only one generation away, one and a half generations away from being defined and regulated and managed and maintained. Now what they have is a root self, notwithstanding when, even when, they made, when he made the analogy, which I thought was really fascinating, globalism as imperialism, which was an ec economic interest versus globalism as humanism, the way we're trying to include or live it now as it relates to di uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, no sensibilities. And listening to him bring that dis uh, description to the fore, we have to understand semantics and how it's understood by the one living it. Because when you were reading the article, I thought, huh, wow. But when he spoke and he inserted the intention of globalism when it was first introduced is not the way we're trying to understand globalism now. Globalism now is a threat 
to those who introduced it before because it was a, a percentage of the globe. Globalism now includes the variety of all people, the intention of the variety of all people, humanism, but you still have people that are determining on a vertical scale who's human enough, who is worthy enough. We're trying to make that a little bit more, not lateral, but circular, so that we recognize that everyone has the right to all access. You mentioned that when I read that, that article the other day, and I like David Brooks, I, I tend to always look out for his columns. But after I read that, I was like, man, he's got a point. There's a pullback here, and we feel it in this country with the red versus blue and what words get used for political purposes and what's happening on the ground and all this discord. I'm reading that, and I'm thinking, wow, are we getting ready to regress here? Then hit Chef Pierre's perspective is the different one. It's a more optimistic one, and he represents that both in his spirit his knowledge and awareness of food and, and this ancient grain that he's promoting, that's saving the soil. There's just so much there to feel good about and his spirit. And I felt differently after having his take. That's I right. Absolutely. I think when you listen to his, his early journey, just his navigation, how he winds up on the shores of the United States and what turn of events has him in one place versus another, being a hard worker and understanding the elements that change the context of food and then how to share it and give it and do it and impart it and continuing to write um, from a different angle. But there's always a humanism. There's always a, a broad audience for his work. Even Yolele, I am uh, a subscriber. So people should actually go online and sign up for yolele.com, that's Y-O-L-E-L-E.com. And you'll get the recipes, which are really fantastic. They come weekly or you know, maybe bi-weekly if something is special coming up while this may air at a different time. This is that holy month where you have Ramadan, Easter and Passover at the same time. And Yolele just released menus for the United Holy Days. No matter how you eat, there is a way to incorporate breaking bread with fonio as one of your foods. So it's just really precious how he engages and stays ever present with the cross section of people, of, of cultures. I really uh, was excited to hear him now for the two of you all to meet, because I know that now that bread is broken, that you will find your way together um, again, which is exciting for me. Without a doubt. Ambassador Shabazz, thank you so much for that introduction to Chef Pierre Thiem, and as always, for your uh, insightful commentary. It's, uh, it's a pleasure. That's our show for today. Thank you for joining us. Corner Table Talk is produced by Corner Table Media.